Good morning again. We've started the recording. This is Emily Heinlein um, with Behavioral Health System Baltimore and the Maryland Harm Reduction Training Institute, welcoming you to the final day of the Syringe Services Program Core Training, December 16th, 2020. Um, glad to be here with you all today. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues from the Maryland Department of Health Center for Harm Reduction Services who are doing the first portion of the presentation today. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, my name is Dana Heilman. I'm the Division Chief for Policy and Program Management in the Center for Harm Reduction Services at the Maryland Department of Health. Um, and I'm gonna be sharing today with my uh, colleague, Allison Thompson, um, who is our Harm Reduction Programs Manager. Um, she oversees Certain services programs, and also on the line we have our uh, center chief Aaron Russell, as well as our other harm reduction programs manager Mark Lockwood, and I'm sure a few of our other folks are on the line as well. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, next slide. Awesome, thank you. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about today is um, the, the center itself and um, our role with syringe services programs in Maryland. We'll go through a little bit of background about syringe services programs and um, talk in detail about the syringe service program law uh, and regulations. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, we already did introductions and you all introduce yourselves on the chat box. Um, we will have time for some questions and answers at the end. And you can also put chat box or put questions in the chat box and um, the slides will be available. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we are located within the um, the Infectious Disease Prevention and Health Services Bureau, which is located within the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration. So this is the mission and vision of the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration, or FIPA. And um, we always read this at the beginning of presentations just to kind of keep us grounded in what the goals of the administration are. So the mission of the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration is to protect, promote, and improve the health and well being of all Marylanders and their families through the provision of public health leadership and through community based public health efforts in partnership with local health departments, providers, community based organizations, and public and private sector agencies, giving special attention to at risk and vulnerable populations. <clears throat> the vision of the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration. Um, is a future in which all Marylanders and their families enjoy optimal health and well being. Next slide, please. Um, so, a little history about our center, the Center for Harm Reduction Services. So, <clears throat> we are a relatively new center. Uh, it's kind of unbelievable to me, but we've almost been in existence for two years. Um, so, we were established in February 2019. And the center was created to centralize a number of different harm reduction activities that were going on throughout the department in different places. So it brought together um, the naloxone administration act or naloxone distribution activities with syringe services program activities, um, as well as some workforce development activities. And I'll talk a little bit more about our programs in a minute here, um, <clears throat> but basically centralize all of those things into one new center um, housed, as I mentioned, within Infectious Disease Prevention and Health Services Bureau with the goal of focusing on serving people who use drugs and reducing the harms associated with drug use. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so this year our team worked on developing some strategic goals and a vision for our, our center. Um, so it's kind of a complement to the um, vision and goal of the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration focused on what our center um, hopes to accomplish. 
So our center's strategic goal is to reduce substance-related morbidity and mortality by optimizing services for people who use drugs. And our center envisions a Maryland where healthcare and social service systems meet the needs of people who use drugs in a comprehensive community-based manner. People who use drugs have equitable access to high quality care and services provided to people who use drugs are free from stigma and discrimination. And so um, <clears throat> the purpose of that strategic goal and vision is really to guide our, um, our grant making as well as our other activities and to kind of center our, our goals. Next slide, please. So um, here's some information about our activities, just to give you a sense of um, all the different things that we oversee. So <clears throat> a few of our major areas, obviously syringe services programs. So um, that's a program defined by statute and regulation. So a big part of our role is monitoring compliance with the statute and regulations, as well as facilitating the approval process for new programs. Um, monitoring best practices as well, providing technical assistance. Um, we provide funding this year to all of the syringe services programs um, <clears throat> and then providing uh, access to trainings like, like this training by Marty. Um, <clears throat> another one of our major areas is the overdose response program. So that's another statute defined program. Uh, and that's, I'll talk more about this later, but that's basically the, um, the way that naloxone distribution in Maryland happens in uh, places outside of a healthcare setting. And so our role with that program is to authorize entities as overdose response programs, which allows them to dispense naloxone outside of um, healthcare settings. We provide a lot of guidance and do a lot of technical assistance around overdose education and naloxone distribution. <clears throat> and then we also um, <clears throat> are uh, Liz Murphy is on the call as well. She uh, is our person on staff who does direct naloxone distribution and education in the community. So we do a lot of that directly as well. Um, <clears throat> the Access Harm Reduction Grants, uh, most of you are probably aware of our grant program. This is a program that funds all of the syringe services programs this year. And um, we also provide uh, in-kind resources in um, in that we prov provide uh, naloxone and fentanyl test strips for eligible organizations. And then the last piece here is workforce development and capacity building. So we have a number of training and development projects for the harm reduction workforce, including regrounding our response, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. Um, <clears throat> we provide support and training for um, counties uh, interested in starting law enforcement assisted diversion programs and um, also technical assistance and support to um, all of these programs, uh, which includes our partnership with Marty. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to include this as well because these are um, some strategic priorities that we outlined for our grant making this year. And I think it, it complements our mission and vision to give you a sense of kind of our priorities. <clears throat> So meeting people where they are, which to us includes prioritizing highly impacted populations, client-centered service delivery, and low barrier, low threshold services, uh, as well as geographically specific strategies. Providing comprehensive services, which um, to us means focusing on the full spectrum of drug user health, um, being responsive to emerging needs, and addressing social determinants of health. And then lastly, um, providing culturally competent and peer-run services, which to us means engaging people with lived experience, um, having an awareness of linguistic competence and health literacy, as well as specifically outreaching to the LGBTQ plus population. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so just to give a little bit of background about the syringe services program itself, so the expansion of syringe ser services was established by statute in 2016, um, and that was through the passage of the Opioid Associ Associated Disease Prevention and Outreach Act, which um, we also just called the Syringe Services Program Law. So up until that point, needle exchange services were only allowed in Baltimore City, um, where they had existed since 1994. 
and were operated by the Baltimore City uh, Health Department and still are. And the, they um, continue to operate under a different kind of set of law. Um, <clears throat> so the, the 2016 law allowed for um, syringe services programs to be expanded in other counties and also allowed for nonprofits in Baltimore City to be authorized to provide syringe services. So um, <clears throat> the first programs that operated under that expanded law started in 2018. And if you can go to the next slide, please, that'll um, show a little bit about uh, how we've expanded since then. And uh, we've expanded quite a lot in Maryland. So the, in the green, you can see um, all of our approved and operational programs. The, the two blue counties you see there are approved, but not quite yet operational, but working very hard to get there. Um, <clears throat> and then you'll see Baltimore City here includes a number of uh, nonprofits as well. So we currently have 15 approved syringe services programs, plus the Baltimore City Exchange Program, which is operated by the Baltimore City Health Department, as I mentioned. Um, and these 15 programs consist of five nonprofit organizations, which are all located in Baltimore City as of now, and um, 10 local health departments. We do have um, one potential nonprofit SSP outside of Baltimore City. That would be the first one. Um, and that's currently under review by the Standing Advisory Committee. Um, there are also two local health departments that work closely with nonprofits to provide syringe services in their jurisdiction. So that's um, Cecil County Health Department works very closely with Voices of Hope and um, Prince George's County Health Department works closely with Family Medical and Counseling Services. There are also two voucher programs that allow people to get um, syringes free of charge from their local pharmacies. And these programs are located in Frederick and Wacomico counties. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the expansion in a nutshell, but if you would like some more detailed information about um, hours and locations, we have a guide on our website that's linked in this slide. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the website's also linked on the last page. So once you get the slides, um, you can take a look at that. Next slide, please. These are some quick statistics from fiscal year 20. So July 1st, 2019 through June 30th of this year. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these, but just to kind of show you how big the impact is of all of the um, syringe services programs in the state. So in fiscal 20, so in one, a single year, um, the programs registered a total of 3,390 brand new participants and had a total of 30,707 encounters and distributed uh, over 2 million syringes and needles. So that's um, really huge and just getting uh, more significant. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So I'm actually gonna turn it over to um, Allison Thompson, our harm reduction programs manager, and she will talk you through um, the rest of the presentation. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, like Dana said, my name is Allison Thompson. I am the harm reduction programs manager. I'm primarily responsible for monitoring the syringe service program. So I think most of you on this call may, may have already met me, if not, um, may have seen an email. So first I wanna discuss the role of MDH in the implementation operations of syringe service programs. And this is uh, very heavily directed by the SSP statute and law. Uh, MDH receives program applications from local health departments and community-based organizations. And upon that initial review, we facilitate the provision of technical assistance from the Standing Advisory Committee, which I'll talk more about later. Um, the Standing Advisory Committee provides feedback on all aspects of the application, but focuses mainly on the referral protocol, the community engagement plan, and the operating procedures. So MDH issues program approval in conjunction with the local health officer of that jurisdiction, and the entire process is mandated by the statute and has to be completed within 60 days. So once we receive an application, we have 60 days to either approve or deny the authorization of that program. Um, we also provide funding to approve programs and local health departments preparing to apply for approval. And this is actually the first year that all syringe service programs are also access grantees, which is really exciting. 
Next slide, please. So a little bit of more, more information. Um, MDH monitors approved programs utilizing check-ins, site visits, and collecting data from each program. And we typically, under normal circumstances, would be performing site visits around this time or a little bit earlier this year, but we're unable to currently because of the pandemic. And we perform these site visits to evaluate whether programs are adhering to best practices and you know just get a feel for the space. I um, participated in some of the site visits last year when I was an intern with the center. So it was really, really awesome to be able to see. Uh, we provide technical assistance to programs and issue program guidance when needed and relevant. And we have the ability to revoke the approval of programs if they're not adhering to best practices and the reporting requirements mandated by the state or by the statute. Next slide, please. So you will receive these slides and I've just linked the, the statute, which is the Maryland Health General article and Comar the regulations for you. If you ever wanna read through them, they're not very long. Um, they're relatively easy to read for what I imagine a statute would be, would be easy to read. So, so they're there for you if you want them. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, the statute mandates kind of all the things we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. So for program development, uh, the statute states that a program may be established by a local health department or a community-based organization. And although we currently do not have any, a community-based organization may establish a multi-county program. So what we're hoping to have that in the near future. Uh, next slide, please. Programs must provide security of program locations and equipment, and, uh, and they must include these protocols in their operating procedures. Program participants must be able to obtain and return syringes at their program locations, and they must provide for the dissemination of other tools to prevent HIV and viral hepatitis, which includes various safe use supplies. Programs must uh, provide linkages to other services, which we'll, I'll get into more detail on the next slide. And, um, Programs must provide education on HIV and viral hepatitis and overdose prevention and naloxone access. Next slide, please. So these are the services mandated by the SSP statute. These services are, have to be provided on site or through a pre-established referral protocol. So one of our tasks while reviewing applications and applicants is to ensure that they have these pre-established protocols for either directly providing these services or having established relationships with partners to provide the services to the people they encounter or participants. Uh, the, those services include this list here, substance related use disorder counseling, treatment and recovery services, HIV, viral hepatitis and STD testing, reproductive health education and services, wound care and overdose education and oxygen distribution. So the, this is a pretty comprehensive list of services, but I, I, and I think most people on this call already know, it goes way beyond this at most programs, including, you know, assistance in finding housing, obtaining insurance, many other social services. So this is just a very small list of what's actually being done in practice. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to touch on staff training. I guess it's relevant because we're all here today. Uh, they staff must have appropriate levels of expertise working with people who use drugs, and staff must be adequately trained to provide referrals, counseling, and prevention education. Uh, typically, these training these training plans are in um, programs operating procedures, and it's usually you know upon hire and as relevant and as needed um, continuing education. So another requirement mandated by the statute relates to the community outreach and engagement plan. And at minimum, this plan, this plan has to include, um, sorry, this has to include a plan to regularly engage with law enforcement, conduct regular needle syringe litter cleanups, document feedback from participants, community and law enforcement, and have a plan of action to address reasonable concerns that come up from those um, documentations. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier about the Standing Advisory Committee. The SSP law establishes a Standing Advisory Committee and dictates its membership. So there are at least 10 members who represent a variety of professional disciplines and personal backgrounds. For example, some of these people is someone from academia who's, who specializes in public health, someone with substance use experience, 
someone who has a family member of someone who used drugs, a uh, local health officer, there's a, there's a whole list. And if you are interested in seeing what uh, qualifications and specializations is required, you can reference the statute that's linked in the other slide. Uh, the committee of, is chaired by the Deputy Secretary of Public Health Services, which is currently Dr. Chan. And the committee is a resource for programs as they progress and grow. For most programs, the operating procedures continuously changes as programs expand. And the Standing Advisory Committee can be a huge resource to update their procedures and, and gain valuable feedback. They also hold quarterly meetings uh, to, to continue providing that, that assistance and also to discuss current issues and trends that are happening. Next slide, please. So I wanted to discuss the unique identifiers since this is a big portion of the statute. Uh, due to stigma and current law, confidentiality for participants is extremely cr crucial and essential, as I think we all know. So similar to, to all harm reduction services, SSP staff work really hard and continuously to build those relationships and trust to provide comprehensive services and care. Uh, violating their confidentiality for participating in certain services can lead to them disengaging, which can have many risks, including overdose, infectious disease, and, and many more. So the, the SSP statute requires programs to issue unique IDs and unique identifier numbers to their participants. These numbers cannot be cross-indexed with any personal identifying data. And the information, any information about participants is to be kept confidential, not open to public inspection or disclosure, and not discoverable in a criminal or civil proceeding. In certain circumstances, participants may agree to disclose their enrollment, but that decision should be based solely on the um, desire of the participant. Next slide, please. I've just included some pictures of some current unique IDs, unique ID cards, and uh, most, most of the cards have language directly pulled from the statutes, and, they, and many programs have also included features to increase the legitimacy of these cards, whether it's embossing or sealed cards, um, something to add, you know, a little extra legitimacy for encounters with law enforcement. And we're currently working to create a statewide unique ID in order to increase legitimacy and ensure that protections of participants are upheld, and also to decrease negative encounters. Next slide, please. So the statute also dictates information that approved programs are required to report to MDH. And this, this data includes number of participants served, number of new participants registered, demographic profiles of those participants, number of needles and syringes distributed and collected, and the number of linkages provided to participants. Uh, the center program managers like myself manage and monitor uh, and work with the SSPs to collect data on a quarterly basis. Next slide. So for these next two slides, I just um, pulled the language directly from the statute for your reference if you're, if you're interested. Um, it, it directly relates to the protections for program staff, volunteers, and participants. So I've just included this in here. Um, Mir, if you wanna skip through the next slide as well. Thank you. Uh, the statute protects program staff, volunteers, and participants of approved programs from being arrested, charged, or prosecuted for certain crimes under the Criminal Law Act. And specifically, these protections um, are for possessing and distributing controlled paraphernalia, such as syringes and other safe use supplies, if the activities are connected with the work of the SSP. And I've bolded that because um, that's a very big, big point of the protections provided. Next slide, please. Participants, volunteers, and employees of the program are not protected if activities are not authorized or approved by the program, or if the program is not, is not approved or pending approval. So they are also not protected for possession, dispensing, distribution, or promotion of controlled drugs, except in cases of residue that is attached to the needles being returned to a certain service program. And also, I want to note that Individuals may be subject to charge or prosecuted if they are, are not a registered participant or if they receive supplies from others and do not enroll the program, which I'll, I'll talk about secondary exchange a little bit more in the next slide. Um, because of this, staff and volunteers should encourage enrollment and for all participants to carry their unique ID at all times. This card is not required to maintain these protections and uphold, uphold these protections, but it is highly encouraged to reduce negative encounters. 
uh, program participants are protected in the entire state, not just the jurisdiction that they are a participant of. So for example, if you are a participant in Washington County and you go to, and you live in Allegheny County, you're still protected by the SSP law and statute. However, on the flip side, volunteers and staff members of a program in Washington County cannot distribute in Allegheny or, or a different county. Um, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. That, or you're on the right side. So MDH does encourage secondary exchange and the statute does not prohibit secondary exchange. Uh, the statute protects participants, but not the recipients of, the, of supplies who are not participants. Um, so you, a lot of programs, they'll create protocols or procedures to be able to account for that secondary exchange. And um, you may be able to help participants that register, that register individuals whom they're providing secondary supplies to. So programs have that autonomy to create and implement secondary exchange protocols. An example of this would be a husband and a wife, or a husband comes in and he's getting supplies for him and his wife. And she never comes in, so she's not protected to have those supplies, although her, her husband is gaining, the, gaining them and protected by the law. So the husband can come in and give the information for, her, for them to create a unique ID for the wife. And then, you know, she can take home a card for her, and then they are both protected. Next slide, please. I think I'm going to pass this one back over to Dana. She's going to talk about the overdose response program and how they differentiate a little bit. Hi again. Um, I am just going to circle back briefly to this, um, to the overdose response program. I know this is a bit... Uh, um, way back to what we were talking about at the beginning. Um, but I did just want to note because um, most of you are providing naloxone uh, at the syringe services program. And so I wanted to clarify about the overdose response program and kind of how it um, relates to the syringe services program. So as I mentioned, it is a separate, um, a separate statute and a separate program. Uh, we do oversee both of them. But um, naloxone is still a prescription medication. It's not a controlled substance, but it is a prescription medication. Um, and so without the overdose response program law, naloxone dispensing would be restricted to a pharmacist dispensing it to someone who has a prescription from their doctor or a doctor giving medication to their patient. So the overdose response program law is what allows for expanded dispensing of naloxone outside of um, those, you know, very specific healthcare situations. <clears throat> and so it's what allows for dispensing at the syringe services programs. Um, and so basically the law, the overdose response program law allows nonprofits, local health departments, and really any other um, type of entity to be authorized by our office um, in MDH and to then enter into agreement, an agreement with a prescriber. And that prescriber issues a standing order um, and through that agreement and through that standing order, any employee or volunteer of the entity um, can, can dispense naloxone to people that they're training in the community. So um, they can do that in situations where the prescriber is not present. So it's through that very specific um, circumstance that you all are allowed to dispense naloxone without a you know, prescription, without a doctor being there. Um, so anytime you're giving naloxone to someone that's happening under the authority of a standing order uh, that is established through an overdose response program that's been authorized by MDH. And so for a lot of you who are um, working at local health departments syringe services programs, so all of our local health departments in Maryland are authorized with um, the state as overdose response programs. So they have an agreement with a prescriber. Um, a lot of times that's the health officer. They have the standing order and they have a bunch of you know, records on file with us. And so typically if you're dispensing naloxone at the syringe services program, you're operating through a partnership under the authority of that um, local health department's overdose response program. Um, I, this is probably stuff that a lot of you already know. <laughs> um, so that is like a, a separate, separate reporting requirements than the syringe services program. And um, your, your program should have kind of protocols and, and dispensing protocols in place to, to know 
um, how you're tracking dispensing of naloxone, um, how you're getting that info back to the people who are reporting for your overdose response program. So they have to report to us on um, the number of doses of naloxone dispensed, uh, a bunch of like demographic, aggregate demographic information, things like that. Um, so I, I think that's all I really wanted to say about that, but we're happy to answer any questions about that as well. And um, I think that's all of our all of our slides. So I think we could answer questions about that or questions about anything that Allison has um, talked about. Thanks so much, Dana and Allison. Uh, one question that I'm seeing in the chat, which um, if you answered it and I missed it, I apologize, but it's, do you have a time frame for when the state ID card may be ready? Um, I want to say in the next couple of months, um, that we're kind of slowing it down a little bit so that we can have an opportunity to get um, some additional feedback from law enforcement. Um, so we, we did mention this at the, the last standing advisory committee, I want to say, um, but one of our priorities that we're slowing down to focus on again is um, to kind of look at what aspects of a statewide card would help to increase its legitimacy, legitimacy with law enforcement. Um, so we're going to take a little bit more time to to really like iron out those details and gather some more information. Um, I see another question in the chat box related to that. I've heard that the state ID card might also be linked to a database of folks who use drugs. Is that accurate? That's absolutely not, not accurate. <laughs> um, so as Allison mentioned, the unique identifying uh, numbers cannot be, um, they're not allowed to be cross indexed or, or like tied to any personal identifying information. So we couldn't even have a database that said, here's the unique ID, here's the person's name. Like that is illegal in terms of this SSP statute. Um, and we at the state would not have any personal identifying information about participants, like period. Hi, I'd like to ask a question. Hi, uh, my name is Jenna Murmur. I, my pronouns are she and her. I am the Reproductive Health Program Supervisor with the uh, Howard County Health Department. Um, so I may have missed this in previous presentations, but I didn't know that it was actually a requirement that SSPs coordinate with reproductive health. We thought we were just doing a cool thing. <laughs> um, so I'm glad to know that because um, it, it lights a little bit of a, a fire, but also um, I'm hoping that there are some resources that either you all or more established SSPs would be able to help us provide. Um, we've been having a lot of challenges with navigating how to prop up community-based STI testing. Um, we have an RV, it doesn't have a bathroom, right? So we developed a policy for how to mail out STI kits, which can kind of be used as well if we have like prepackaged kits, people can take it home and then they can either mail it back to us, bring it back to us, take it to another lab. We're trying to navigate all, you know, like, should we pick one of those? Should we leave it up to the client to pick which one of those is best? Um, it'd be great to see examples from other people. And then there are two other like policy areas that we have questions about. Uh, one is rapid syphilis testing that is new for us and we're um, looking to go down that path. So um, we already do community-based HIV testing but um, and, and hep C testing, but syphilis testing would be new. Um, and then related, again, related to STI, community-based STI testing through the SSP, we heard from Elizabeth Lebo, who I think is with CSTIP, um, that the SSP sticker allocation would come out of the reproductive health, so the Title X program, like our allocation in the clinic, um, which is kind of concerning for us because it's, you know, we're not getting an, an additional allocation for additional clients. It's just kind of being taken out of the uh, number that we're, the existing number that we're given. So, um, I wasn't sure if that was the path that other people had gone down or if there was another way around that so that we're not reducing our, you know, we're expanding our reach, but actually reducing our capacity in, in all of those areas. Um, so grateful for any uh, input in any of those areas. Thank you. 
Yeah, I um I won't pretend to be a subject matter expert in in any of the areas you just mentioned, but um we we do work in the same bureau as Elizabeth and the CSIP program, and um so we're happy to you know uh, set up a conversation with them and all of us and brainstorm and uh, you know problem solve and and do whatever we can to help um, come up with uh, solutions. But also, I wanted to just pitch our we have a monthly collaborative call and actually next month we'll, we break out into three separate calls um so it's really it's like all of our harm reduction programs and it's a good opportunity to bring those questions to like the full group and um you know get get answers about what other people are doing and um so i would encourage you to join those calls and um also if if you want to have an offline conversation with us about uh, solving these things specifically, we are happy to do that. Thank you. Thanks so much for bringing that up, Jenna. Um, this is Emily from um, from Marty and the Maryland Harm Reduction Training Institute. I also want to put out there that we are um, in the process of building a, a library of policies, sample policies, um, and other resources. Um, so we're making note of the the ones you have suggested, and if there are other if there's anyone else on this call or, or any other program um, with requests for specific policies that um, that you would love to see examples of from other programs, please feel free to reach out to the Marty staff. You can reach us at um, marty at bhsbaltimore.org and I'll put that uh, so you have the right spelling in the chat. I'm referring to the... Um unique identifiers um, we have one at, we have one at voices of hope we have a card it's through our health department the harmony program um, like on the back of the card we have the address or the zip code of where the person lives their mother's first initial their ethnicity the race and then the client's age like the birth month the birth year and the first two letters of their name and then one for female or one for male or one and two for female. And that's on the back of the card. That's how we, that's their unique identifier. And uh, it, it works very well because people know that their information ain't out there where somebody can just jump on there and say, yeah, this is me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also that helps for recollection purposes, you know, if, if worst case scenario, there is a, an interaction with law enforcement and they are willing to say like, hey, I'm a program of this, I'm a participant of this program, this is my unique identifier. If they don't have their card on them, that also helps, you know, if, they, if you're walking them through that unique identifier process, they can say, this is my unique ID. And you can call Cecil County Health Department or Voices of Hope and verify my enrollment, even, you know, without the participant's name. Right, right. Um, we have had some roadblocks with certain police. Um, they don't like the fact that we have the program. So they treat people kind of crazy about it. They throw people cards away and they get upset because they think they got a bus and they don't. And, uh, but we have got some police that's, uh, actually helping us out, like letting us know when new drugs come about, when, um, like the situations when they get to the hospital and, they let us know that is a new drug out that's not really able to be brought back from like with the Narcan and everything like that. So um, they said it had like a, a a reaction like you was on PCP where it was you was just all hyped up and stuff like that. So they give us information and you know what I mean we give them information like about. Uh, if somebody has overdosed to just be on watch or something like that, you know, I mean, just watch this area type thing. But we do, we did in the beginning have a problem with the police because it was just like, they was just, they didn't agree with it. You know what I mean? Because they felt though they was missing that opportunity to get something bigger, I guess. I don't know. 
Absolutely. And that's why that's why I believe in when the statute was written, all you know, in this community engagement plan, these interactions and how to document interactions with law enforcement is so heavily mandated and included in the statute because, you know, that relationship building, even with law enforcement, unfortunately, it's kind of necessary right now to, you know, protect the protect the participants and and it can it can be a positive relationship. And I know I know specifically in Cecil, Cecil County, we've gotten a lot of feedback that that has, that has progressed and grown over time. And, you know, you guys have done a lot of great work to, to make that happen. Right. Does anyone else have any more questions before we hand it over to our wonderful panelists and Oh, I've included, if, if you have any general questions or just need any assistance with certain service programs, you can email the certain services email. I've linked the website for when you are able to um, receive these slides. And then also myself and Dana's email are linked here. Great. Thanks so much, Allison and Dana, for that presentation. Thank you. So we, the second portion of our time today is a, um, a panel uh, on harm reduction in practice. We have four wonderful panelists joining us today. Um, Mark Robinson from Family and Medical Counseling Services in Prince George's County, Harriet Smith from Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition in Baltimore City, Jessica Ellis from Frederick County Health Department, and Katie Carroll from Cecil County Health Department. Um, so, I am going to invite them to uh, unmute themselves and come on camera or mute and unmute as, as works. And um, I've, I'm handing it over, I think, to my colleague, Saul Corbin, to moderate the conversation. Hey, folks. Um, so first of all, if the uh, panelists could just kind of uh, wave in and, and say hey to the to our troops today, that would be great. So uh, we'll start off with uh, uh, Mark. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Robinson with Family and Medical Counseling Service. Uh, and we are providing syringe services to Prince George's County. Okay, thank you, Mark. Harriet? Harriet, are you with us? She looks frozen. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, okay, I'm not sure if Harriet's with us or not. Oh, Maybe. I I am sorry. It froze oh, for a second. Go. I'm sorry. sorry. About that, Harriet. <laughs> it keeps happening. I'm okay. I'm Harriet Smith. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. I'm calling in from Baltimore City, um, where Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition does the majority. Okay, thanks, Harriet. Jessica. Good morning. I'm Jessica Ellis. I'm the Harm Reduction Program Coordinator in Frederick County and overseeing our ORP, our SSP, and our rapid testing program. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Katie? Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Carroll. I am the Harm Reduction Program Coordinator at the Cecil County Health Department, where we have our fixed site and we collaborate with Voices of Hope for um, street outreach to provide syringe services in Cecil County. Okay, great. Thank you all so much, the panelists, for being here and sharing your uh, experience and expertise. Um, we have some pre-established questions that we will just kind of rotate through the panel, if that's okay with you. Um, I'll go in the same order every time in which you, you were introduced. Um, so that would be Mark, uh, Harriet, Jessica, and then Katie. And we'll just, we'll cover as many questions as, as time allows. Um, if you have questions for the panelists, uh, as we're going through, I encourage you to put that in the chat um, so as we don't kind of disrupt the flow. And if we need to pause for whatever me, uh, reason, we can do that. Um, so I'm going to put the first question in the chat for our panelists. Hopefully. Hold up. Okay, there we go. So the first question is, how have you adjusted provision of services because of COVID-19? and what has worked and what hasn't. We'll start off with Mark. Good morning again, everyone. 
Uh, great question. Um, COVID-19 kind of caught us as it did everyone by, by surprise. Um, and of course, with, with syringe service, syringe services and with the backpack model, it's an up close and personal model. It's a model that allows us to go into the various communities and subgroups of people that we interact with um, to build that relationship with those participants. And of course, because of the potential health risk involved with COVID and there initially being so much uncertainty and misinformation and lack of information about the um, disease itself, it, it, it presented a somewhat of a roadblock. So initially we were not providing services and um, to try to get a handle on what our protocols should be. Um, uh, the fortunate thing was once we did get back on deck and received the protective, um, personal protective equipment and the tools needed to be able to provide services within the community and to make sure the staff was safe and to make sure that the participants that we were encountering were safe. Um, it, by having pre-established those relationships, it was less of a barrier um, in that people still needed our services. Um, the pandemic did not hinder the need that existed within those communities for people that needed to have sterile syringes and other drug using supplies and other hygiene equipment. And what we actually learned was, of course, because of the shutdowns and the closings throughout many businesses throughout the county, people didn't have places to wash their hands, um, to take care of their basic hygiene needs. Um, water was not available. Uh, it, it created a scenario in the streets for people that were living uh, in the street primarily that um, they were really at wit's end. Um, but still the, the, the need for our services kind of skyrocketed and our numbers actually um, increased um, because people were very, very desperate. And I think that <clears throat> the pandemic more or less exposed a level of desperation that pretty, pretty much was already there. Uh, but nevertheless, what we did was we, we, of course, made sure staff was safe and protected. Uh, we began to use tongs to pass out equipment. Uh, we had our um, own personal protective equipment. We also were able to hand out masks and protective equipment for uh, our participants if they didn't have that. Um, and we just made the adjustment. And, you know, the, 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 you, I guess the most important thing during these kinds of times for us, and this is what I've learned in this experience, are the people. Um, the level of commitment that my staff has in engaging and helping people uh, and not being taken aback by what's going on around them. Um, the need has always been there. It's never changed. Uh, and, and I think the, the pandemic has even exposed that to a greater degree, but my people, have um, kind of ramped up their commitment to go forward in spite of the challenges. And that has been the, the most um, amazing thing to see, uh, to watch, watch folk, you know, really, really hunker down and say, hey, we're, we're, we're doing this um, and we're gonna make sure we get it done. And that's just the bottom line. And, and I, I know our participants are grateful um, and I'm definitely grateful for having a staff that has that level of commitment. Um, <clears throat> but that, that, has, that has worked, you know, and we've, we've made the adjustments where situations have not been safe. Of course, that's been the, the general consensus is, you know, you keep it moving. If something is not safe and, and um, you, you feel unprotected or as if some danger is imminent, then of course you, you leave that area. Um, and that's what we've done. And because we're in a mobile unit, as well as with the protective equipment, we go into these areas <clears throat> and we also do home deliveries. Uh, we make sure that we're socially distanced. And again, these are, these, are, these are techniques that weren't being practiced before. And it seems strange because outreach is an up close and personal uh, uh, type of dynamic, but because we've um, 
have these relationships with folk and people have a need for what we have, they're, they're, not, they're not hindered by the need for us to remain safe and also to keep them safe. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Harriet? Sure. I'm going to turn off my video just in case that helps with uh, me not freezing uh, my internet. Um, so, yeah, I completely uh, echo much of what Mark was saying in terms of of the, the pandemic um, exposing to a greater degree to more people uh, existing problems. Um, one thing, I'll, and I'll keep it kind of short because um, there was so much practical advice that was just given. Um, it's odd to think that uh, right when we heard this pandemic was coming, we gathered as staff in a tiny room because it was the warmest room <laughs> uh, all together without masks. Uh, it's again, odd to think of now, but we gathered together and just, you know, talked through what does this mean for us? Um, and we, we encourage each other with the sort of sen sentiment that folks who are survivalists or sort of doomsdayers or, you know, people who prepare for uh, significant shutdowns um, are really, you know, set up for, for doing well in this kind of scenario, but so are harm reductionists. We may not have as much stuff and we certainly don't have bunkers and things like that, but we are extremely scrappy and flexible. Um, and we have to be constantly to get our work done. So I think the, the folks who are scrappy and flexible and creative um, are, are doing okay. It's an emotional toll, uh, no doubt. Um, but we're, we're all figuring ways to, to stay engaged with people who, who don't have a lot of services uh, tailored to them. Um, so some of the ways that we have done that are to do almost everything outdoors. Um, to require masks being worn if folks want to chat. Um, much like Mark said, we, we pack up bags for people and then hand them the bags. So we don't use tongs, but a similar, similar idea of like have the least amount of people touching things as possible um, and, and those sort of things. But I really, yeah, I just want to praise our collective flexibility and creativity that I think harm reductionists across the state have done a really great job staying, um, staying open and, and staying available to, to folks who are you know, experiencing homelessness, folks who are disconnected from various healthcare services and, and don't have a lot of safety net services besides us. Great, thanks so much, Harriet. Uh, Jessica? So I will apologize now. I'm going to leave my camera on, but probably many of you saw I have children that will frequently run behind me. So apologies. Um, I will also, I'm, I'm going to be mimicking what Mark and Harriet had both said. So in Frederick County, I can say um, COVID was highly impactful, but it did not interrupt our services at all. So we were able to continue providing services through the entire pandemic. Um, and so we initially had um, a fixed site location as well as mobile services. And the biggest addition that we did with COVID was expanding to offer delivery services. Um, and this has been incredibly helpful, I think, for two reasons. One, it's really allowed people that didn't have the ability to access us um, in our fixed sites and kind of keeping track of our, our mobile locations, that access. But then it also really kind of, it offered an opportunity to individuals who may have been apprehensive to access services or fearful um, to kind of completely remain completely anonymous. So we actually have situations where we do deliveries where, you know, we are doing a delivery to someone's trunk of a car, shutting and securing the trunk, and then they're doing a text or phone call confirmation that they received it. And we never see their face. You know, they can truly completely remain anonymous. Um, which has been important to some folks, you know, some people who use drugs in our community at least. Um, we also have modified um, our fixed site in our mobile location. So much of what Harriet said, um, we do everything outdoors. So we're not allowed to have anybody on our mobile van now. And at our fixed site location, we actually have just kind of shifted to outdoors in the sense of you know, we come outdoors to meet people, you know, we kind of take their order and then we're going indoors um, to kind of fill their order and then hand off that bag. 
we are doing rapid testing um, and we do allow people in our fixed site location for that, um, but that's going through kind of COVID screening and protocols. But, you know, obviously everyone has to wear a mask um, no matter where the interaction is taking place. And we've increased um, the supplies that we're distributing based on that. So kind of what Mark mimicked as well is, um, you know, handing out gloves and masks and hand sanitizer and those kind of precautionary supplies to people if they didn't have access to them. Um, and we also, um, during the summer, had increased outreach to places like encampments um, and were distributing things as in larger quantities. Also mimicking what Mark said about people not having access to things that they normally would, you know, we knew that a lot of individuals didn't have access to water at all, you know, so instead of handing out water bottles, we were taking gallon jugs, you know, into the encampments and making sure that we could provide the little bit that we could, um, you know, just to keep people get keep people getting by. All right, thank you, Jessica. Katie? Hi everyone. I'm probably going to echo a lot of what Harriet, Mark, and Jessica shared. Um, I wanted to also just reflect back, like Harriet, uh, to the beginning of everything. I came back to work after maternity leave the week that the whole world was closing down. Um, the building was closing down, which is where our fixed site is located. So trying to switch everything over to be able to offer services to individuals was a huge challenge, but um, by Wednesday, we had everything ready to go. We switched to a delivery outreach model where we secured Sharps containers in the back of our van. Uh, we were having folks call in to give us their orders to access the other services that the program offers, like peer support, uh, care coordination for testing, overdose response, education, and supplies. Um, and we would fill their order here at the health department. We'd take orders up until like 1130 and then fill bags, 12 o'clock, we'd hit the streets so we could get the deliveries out to folks. We would put the individual's bag in the back where the Sharps container was housed so that they could just come out, pop the trunk. Um, it's a Dodge minivan. So we have that, you know, more than six feet of space to where the participant did want to interact or talk or just have some contact, they were able to do that. Um, I love being able to market my skills as a person who previously used drugs, so being innovative and having a mission in mind and being able to do it and by any means possible be able to bring these services to individuals was very important um, when I came back because Cecil County is very rural and conservative, so getting these services here in the first place was a huge challenge and it was scary to think that they could just go away or um, it wouldn't be available to folks. Cause I think back to when I was using how beneficial they could have been, how much damage I could have avoided um, if those services had been available. And we're lucky enough here in Cecil County to have Voices of Hope, our community-based organization partner um, that's out in the community almost every day of the week doing backpack outreach to individuals. So. Either we used to, when we were allowed around other people, we would have bag packing parties, we'd order food, we'd all hang out, throw on music, pack bags. Um, when COVID hit, it was just giving them a large amount of supplies so that they could, um, following guidelines at their, out, or their recovery community center, pack bags. And then um, we also have, uh, We've increased now, we've increased our walk up for people to pick up because there were some people that felt more safe. Um, they didn't want a van showing up at their house that they share with family where they're popping a trunk and grabbing a bag out. They didn't want neighbors to see. We had people that were putting signs in the yards of saying, I know what you're doing um, and contacted the health department. So we made that option available to folks or meeting at, um, discrete locations to try and uh, meet our participants' needs. So that's pretty much how we've adapted um, here in Cecil County due to COVID. And it's all been, I, I will say that it's been a blessing for our community um, to kind of have our building closed down so that we're out there more. Um, it's kind of 
different working with the state as, as a local health department. Um, we're not out as much as we would like, but that really got us out in the community where we need to be talking to participants and getting them what they need. Uh, thanks, Katie. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to keep things moving, but before I move forward, just want to make sure if there's any specific questions to any of the panelists for that first round there. We got one from Anthony. Has this pandemic affected any resources that your program receives? For example, has any program been told that we can't get you these supplies, resources, and or funding because of COVID? Uh, it's not specific to anyone, so if any of the panelists would like to answer that. I'll jump on that real quick. Um, I'll just say it's been a challenge with some of our suppliers for safer use supplies uh, in delivery times. There's some things that are on allocation through our medical suppliers to where, you know, you get one box of alcohol pads or you get one box of the BZK wipes that we provide to people. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I don't know what the cause is. I, I just figure they're rerouting supplies to hospitals um, and it's been a challenge to keep our supply up. And another challenge was the volume of supplies that we started giving folks depleted the amount that we were able to order. Um, so we started giving folks weeks, two weeks supply at a time um, to decrease the interaction, still checking in on folks by phone. But that was another thing, trying to adjust to the volume that we were giving out and then being able to receive. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, I'm happy to weigh in on that as well. Um, our suppliers also told us that they were being um, restricted by the federal government from selling us alcohol pads because the federal government was going to uh, collect them all from various warehouses. Um, that didn't end up happening, but there was this constant fear of that. And, and like Katie, um, there was a reduction in how much we could buy at a time. Um, from some of these, you know, uh, suppliers. Um, and then, yeah, everything for everyone became scarce. Bottled water became scarce. Um, hand sanitizer became scarce, um, things like that. Now we're actually hitting a period of time where the mail is really quite slow. So um, anything that needs to be shipped through any sort of mail service, including USPS, but not only uh, tends to come quite a bit later. Um, and that, that has been a, a really big concern, particularly because we also mail people naloxone across the state of Maryland. Um, and we need to be able to count on that getting there rather quickly. And others who are receiving it need to count on it getting there rather quickly. And we've tracked some of the packages in the last few weeks um, and they've been quite delayed. So yeah, trying to find ways around those things. Um, has been a challenge, but it's also allowed us to come together with distilleries in in the city who, you know, pivoted to make hand sanitizer instead of uh, other types of alcohol and things like that. So we've we found ways around it um, for the most part, but it's certainly quite a few challenges there. Yeah, thanks, Harriet. I see Mark's unmuted. Yes, and we, we experienced the same sort of challenges, and it was a delicate balancing act in terms of our inventory and our supply chains. Um, and communicating with, with some of the entities that supply us with our syringes and other drug using tools. They told us that we would have to receive um, a limited amount uh, in intervals. So uh, of course we went with that plan. Um, the other thing that was resourceful for us is that we had other entities throughout um, the county and other places to, and, and also in DC that we were able to People were donating different things to us um, that helped our programs uh, be able to supply water and other materials that were needed for, by people. Um, so that was also very, very good. Uh, Thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, question. Let's see if I can uh, put that in the chat. And... That question is, um, how do you ensure proper data collection during encounters in less than ideal situations? And why don't we start, can we start with uh, uh, Jessica this time? I want to start with you. Sure. Um, so 
We, for certain service um, encounters, we always utilize an encounter form. So whether we're doing that during street outreach and we're giving someone a starter pack and signing them up, whether it's during outreach at our pharmacy that has our voucher program, it's at our mobile locations, or it's um, at our fixed site or delivery, um, all of our staff are equipped with, you know, book bags, you know, clipboards. They can take those encounter forms with them. Um, they can make notes on them. Um, and then that data entry is done later. Um, but then all of our staff also are equipped with tablets um, and phones with hotspots so that they could actually, you know, connect and have connection. So that, you know, that real time data entry could occur if someone would choose it. Um, but for the most part, all of us usually are just jotting things down, filling out the encounter forms, and then all of it is getting inputted at a later date. Thanks, Jessica. Let's go to uh, Katie next. Sure. So when we first started, there was two pages. And for the street outreach with Voices of Hope, that was just very unrealistic. Um, it took a lot of time away from just the conversation and the relationship that the volunteers or the working peers um, with, with the lived experience, it took a lot of the time away from just the interaction and it was just lots of questions. So over time, we just condensed, um, changed forms, edited, cut stuff out, tried to find different ways to capture um, to the point now we're at just a daily uh, walk log um, so that they can focus more on that interaction with individuals. Um, and we've also been working with our um, electronic health records company to develop a mobile app that we're able to use for folks. And the only thing that's entered into that system is the participant ID. There's no uh, personal identifying information that's logged there, but it would be available for real-time data entry out in the field. Um, and we continue to adapt uh, and we'll probably have to expand a little bit for our expanded services for FY21, but we always try and make sure that we get what we need, but the main focus is that relationship with the participant and, and what we're able to do for them. Yeah, thanks Katie, appreciate that. Mark? Yes, um, I, I mirror Katie's comment. Um, the the relationship piece is is extremely important. It, it's relationship, relationship, relationship with the participants, and the services um, are participant centered. Uh, it, it's never an ideal situation when you're in a high drug trafficking area or an area where people are using. Um, there there are no um, places to um, to run and hide. Uh, you have to. It, it's it's a it's not a controlled environment by any means. Um, it's not a nice um, sheltered area where you're sitting down having a conversation. People are generally uh, very adamant about doing what it is that they they're out there in the street to do, um, and we are in their not in their way, but we're in their purview and in an effort to help them. Uh, so we're really interrupting, <laughs> for lack of a better uh, way of putting it, their, their mission. So we have to fit into their profile, into their program. Uh, but data collection on our end is also very, very important. All of our staff are equipped with, uh, with tablets that allow us to collect the data. Um, we have a, a roughly a 25, uh, 25, it's a battery of questions, which is about 25 questions. And um, we try to go through them as quickly and as concisely as possible um, to get the information um, and, and keep it moving, get the person supplied with what they need um, so as to not be a hindrance, but to be a help. Um, and and that's, a, that's a skill that, that um, gets perfected over time of engaging with people and learning what works and what doesn't work and being sensitive to where a person is. Uh, sometimes we have to write stuff down. Sometimes, you know, if the tablet isn't responsive, we have to, you know, be able to write information down. Um, so that that's all of those things come into, come into play, but it's never an ideal situation. It's never a controlled situation. Um, 
things can change at the bat of an eye. Uh, but we, we again, the, 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 the learning takes place over time and we get more perfected at it over time. But the, the basic thing is that we do come away with the data that our tablets are very efficient and effective in allowing us to gather the information. We've established an operating system specifically for this program that allows us to capture all of the outcomes that we're looking to, to touch and reach um, when addressing this population. Um, but again, we're, we're in the community, we're in people's faces, um, not literally in their faces, but we're up close and personal with people. So um, that relationship is very, very important. Uh, sometimes we have to circle back, you know, sometimes we have to circle back to a person and, and, and gather information. Uh, but it, it, it depends on the, the situation. It depends on the, the uh, skill of the, the outreach worker. You know, they, they really have to be sensitive to the need of the person. Um, there's a lot more I can say, but I'm going to share the time. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, Harriet? Yeah, um, it's it's always a challenge. I really, I, I'm glad that we're not alone, that data collection is always a challenge. And then um, trying to make, you know, interactions a little bit shorter and, you um, know that the longer we spend around each other, the more likely we are to um, breathe air that the other person has breathed and, you know, just increase risk. Um, so we, we always try to include um, in any, any kind of like, you know, shift to our data collection, the mantra of the data should serve the program and not vice versa. So we are not researchers who are excited to collect data for its own sake. We are a program that wants to collect data so that we can analyze ourselves to benefit the program. And so we never want to put data first and program last. Um, so we really try to make sure that we're getting somewhat of an accurate picture, but know that it's better to serve someone than it is to collect information about them. Um, so some of what Mark said about like looping back later with somebody and, and trying to be as creative as possible um, about, you know, what people can skip or, you know, not bother asking at this point and things like that um, are, are very important to us. Um, one thing that we do is uh, often we'll ask people to use a sort of a code name for themselves or a nickname for themselves so that we're not asking them for their date of birth. Um, you know, letter of their mom's first name and their all their demographics over and over again. Um, and no one can remember that unique identifier. I don't know, I would be very impressed if someone could. I certainly uh, do not know my own unique identifier by heart. But if I wanted to go by, I don't know, Smiley, and um, if I was able to say that, that nickname each time um, and there aren't repeats, yeah, I could go look up Smiley's information again so I don't have to ask it over and over again. Things like that, you know, we really try to be as flexible as possible. Um, and there have been times when folks have said like, oh, I, I would love to take some Narcan, but not if you need my name and stuff like that. I'm like, you know what, just take the Narcan. Do you know how to use it? That's a more important question. Uh, should we chat, you know, about, you know, ways to use it. What have you been seeing lately? You know, uh, trends and things like that in the neighborhood. Way more important. I can make up a name for them later. And I know that's an awkward thing to say in front of our, our regulatory body here, but um, I really do feel it's important that the data serve um, the distribution of, of information and supplies. And, and yeah, we put that second um, in terms of our, our goals and what that, what that practically looks like is a lot of um, physical paper. Uh, we don't bring things of much uh, monetary value with us on outreach. There's uh, been outreach workers, not with BHRC, but uh, else, elsewhere who've gotten mugged. And so we just like don't bring things of value. Uh, we bring an ID, what we call mug money. So like five to $10 so that someone doesn't get upset if they try to mug us and we have nothing um, and a phone. And we really try to keep other things of value uh, back at, at the office. So we, yeah, we jot down notes and fill out the paperwork later, um, much like Jessica said. Thank you so much, Harriet. Um, before we go to the next question, any specific questions for the panel uh, on this second round?
All righty. We're going to keep it moving then. Uh, let's go to uh, the third question. Um, and that third question is. OK, there it is. How do you continue to make connections and build relationships with participants and others you encounter during COVID? Excellent, excellent question. Let's start with, um, can we start with Katie this time? Sure. I mentioned some of it in earlier response. Katie, you're muted. Could have sworn I heard it click. Um, so I mentioned some stuff in earlier answers, but mostly, you know, everything's virtual now. We're doing a lot of stuff by phone. Um, we're, we're still able to connect people, which is amazing. I'm really glad that we're able to do that. Um, and like I said, those short interactions that we have with folks, you know, from the back of the van to the front of the van, um, even when we have people walk up at a distance, we have um, a safe room set up. That's what they call it in the one of our group rooms here. So we have plexiglass for someone to sit on, you know, the, the person providing services to sit on one side. There's a phone in there. Um, if someone wants to come in, warm up, like sit down for a minute, uh, we allow folks to do that there also. Um, we're trying to expand uh, like participation in groups or just like create a place for people to talk um, that are participants. So we've tried opening up groups virtually. We'll put flyers with um, like a Google Meet link in there and just have a peer available at the same time every week uh, for people to log on and chat or just connect and, and talk. Um, we're looking to maybe start a harm reduction works meeting here in Cecil County. And um, that's a structured like meeting program, like a 12 step, um, but it's for people that practice, uh, people that use drugs, people that practice harm reduction in their use. Um, so we're looking to start one of those here in Cecil County too, just to provide something virtually for people to engage in as well. Um, but that's kind of what we've been doing here in Cecil. It's a huge challenge and we can tell when how people are affected by it. Um, I, I showed up to one of our participants' house and I could just see from the front of the van, like she had, she's welled up with tears and it's so hard not to do things that you're not supposed to do <laughs> to make that person feel human and feel better and make that connection. Um, so it's been a huge challenge for us because all, all the people that work in our program here have lived experience. Um, so there's just more of a connection there. So it's hard not to do the human thing and give them a hug and, and try and make them feel better, you know, but um, we're doing what we can here to try and continue to build. And we always give folks an opportunity to like, hey, what do you need? Is what I'm ordering serving you? Is there something else that I could do? Is there another supply that I could provide to you? We just ordered like hand warmers and boot warmers for folks because it's getting cold out and like the thermal foil uh, heat trapping blankets um, for people that don't have any type of housing to try and provide folks. We have hygiene supplies that we try to give people just to make them comfortable and, and always try and give them a voice and make sure they know that this is their program. You know, I just do the ordering and, you know, coordinate all the other stuff to make it happen. So that's what we do here. Thanks so much, Katie. You know, I really appreciate the, the panelists' um, uh, responses. Uh, in, in, in all of the rounds so far, they've all mentioned you know, just that, that importance of that relationship, right? And, and I think that's like, it's, if it's not the most, it's certainly one of the more salient questions that this COVID has brought about because, you know, everything is online now and distancing and everything. And so it's really brought our, uh, the quality and quantity of our relationships into, into view. So I appreciate that. Mark, you wanna go next? Yes, um, this is a great question and it probably could, um, have a segment all to itself um, because you're right. The relationship piece is probably the, 
biggest, biggest piece. And as I was stating earlier, it's the people. Um, and, you know, the, the concern for the people, the, the, the desire to want to serve and, and <clears throat> you know, minimizing the stigmas. Um, because believe it or not, there, there are still huge stigmas associated with servicing um, the populations that we service. And the truth of the matter is, is that with our staff, we, we recognize that there really isn't much difference between the person providing the service and the person receiving the service, as much as we like to think there is, but there really, really isn't. Um, they just made a different decision. Um, and, um, but what we do is we, as Katie mirrored, we, we try to provide other <clears throat> um, tangible things that are needed by those communities, participants in those communities uh, to help them um, manage uh, in their day-to-day -day activities, the hygiene kits. Um, there's been instances where we've given out clothing. Um, there's been instances where we've seen people that may have needed something. I remember there was one situation where there was a young girl who um, couldn't have been no more than maybe 18 years old. And she had on a pair of shoes as big as I would wear. And I wear a size 12. And um, so, you know, we took that information back to the to our agency and, and people donated shoes. And we were able to, to get her um, some shoes uh, that fit, um, things of that nature, um, water. Uh, basic supplies, just building the relationship, letting people know we, that, that we really do care uh, about them. And that, that's so important. So prior to COVID, we had conversations, we listened, we listened. Um, you know, people, people talked and we listened. And, you know, we, so there's an there's a, there's a element of goodwill that's associated with the program. You know, so when we show up, they know that we're there to help. We're not there to be in the way. We're not there to create a problem. We're not there to, you know, um, throw shade. We're not there for any of those reasons. Uh, we're there to help. And that goodwill goes a long way. And then the word of mouth uh, spreads, you know, and, and that's, 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 that's huge in these communities. Um, yeah. And, and we've been able to, to, to nurture those relationships. So when COVID hit, you know, the same people are showing up and, and other people that are associated with those people, uh, we were able to get intel that allows us to go to trap houses and supply um, syringes and other need, needed equipment. Um, and in Prince George's County, what we learned is that the, the, the usage is more covert than overt. So in communities that don't look like um, a typical high drug trafficking area. You may have places where people are in a gated community, but yet they're in that house over there that looks very nice from the outside, but they're using on the inside. Uh, so. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mark. And what really stands out to me in terms of your responses and probably the most important factor in relationship building is that consistency of how you show up, right? Like that's what builds, you know, trust. That's what builds rapport in the community. and. Really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Harriet? Sure. Um, it seems like a lot of the, the things that really help people be seen um, and understood have been mentioned sleeping bags and, you know, uh, masks and hand sanitizer and snacks and food and all of that. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of focus on a few other elements. Um, I, something that we try to remember, something that I personally try to remember a lot is that whatever makes me a good friend or a good family member also makes me a good service provider. So um, asking people how their day is, being friendly, but also being a little nosy, like, oh, like, remember last week you were kind of upset, like, how did that work out? You know, just trying to, um, yeah, trying to ask questions, but also recognize when it's too much for someone and back off and be flexible. Um, we do a lot of handwritten notes and letters. Um, we do a lot of uh, sort of like small touches. So once we learn someone's favorite color and we see a mask that's like zebra pink something, then we're like, oh, I set it aside for so-and-so. Um, and that, you know, it's a quick exchange. 
Um, it's not a long conversation, which I wish we could have, but it, it helps people feel like, oh, you were thinking about me between, you know, outreach shifts. Um, we know certain people really like certain flavors of Ensure. So <laughs> like, oh, I saved you a chocolate, like things like that, I think um, can, can be really nice and, and help again, sort of build a relationship, even though we're not really getting to know each other super well right now with, with rather quick encounters. Um, another thing that we've, we've done more of um, since COVID for relationship building is have relationships with fewer people but those folks are already uh, encountering a lot of people who might need supplies themselves. So we've, we've linked up with a couple drug dealers um, because they are seeing a number of folks and they're not gonna slow down because of COVID necessarily. Um, and so equipping them with supplies um, to do secondary exchange, um, but also just to meet some of the basic needs, snacks, water, um, hand sanitizer, masks, um, you know, even nail files and just like, you know, pads and tampons, just all the regular stuff that in many places where there aren't stores and aren't the means to get things, even if there are, um, can be really helpful for somebody else to pass out, even if we can't, um, you know, stand somewhere all day and pass out to folks. So I think those are things that have been helpful for us, you know, a little bit of nosiness, a little bit of secondary exchange and finding those hubs already. Um, and yeah, trying to trying to remember those personal touches, saving people little pieces of candy and things like that and brightly colored masks and things like that. Great, thank you, Harriet. Uh, Jessica? So I really don't have too much more to add to that. I think my entire response for this question was gonna be around what you said, um, Sal, and just the consistency. I think the way we've continued to build relationships and improve relationships and strengthen relationships with our participants is that consistency. You know, our services never stopped. We have always been there. They have always known how to access us. We've increased access when so many people have stopped access to, you know, other services and, and other needs that individuals have. Um, you know, like all of the others have shared, you know, we also changed some of the supplies we've distributed, you know, just by really listening to what the needs are of the individuals we're serving. And, you know, if that means, you know, we're doing the hand warmers and the foot warmers and the blankets and you know, the hats and gloves and all of those things. But then also, you know, little things like, um, you know, sending Allison an, an email saying, is this allowable an allowable expense? You know, when participants are saying, you know, hey, you know, COVID's going on and, you know, I've been normally picking up people's cigarette butts, you know, and, and smoking them this way, you know, what could be safer and, you know, us getting permission to buy like tobacco pipes, you know, so people can take it apart and, you know, have put them in something safe that's there. So just really trying to be creative, I think, has built relationships as well. But then we also um, have continued to do surveys. Um, so we also are soliciting feedback, you know, from our participants in a more confidential way that's not those relations, you know, those conversations. And then just to kind of increase communication, we also implemented a text alert system, which has been incredibly helpful because it has, and from what our participants have already shared, it, it almost makes them feel like they're more in the loop, like they have a way to always know what's going on with us. You know, so we do utilize social media and other kind of creative ways just to stay in touch. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jessica. So um, we have time for one more round. We're gonna try and close the panel out at about 11.45ish. Um, uh, so that gives us about 10 minutes or so roughly to answer this final question. Um, and then we'll have closing comments from um, all, all of our team. So uh, this next question is, how are you meeting the needs of marginalized populations? I won't identify those populations. I'll let our panel uh, choose uh, how they want to respond to that. Um, can we start off with Harriet this time? Is that all right? That's fine with me. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, so um, we thought some about this at the the onset of the pandemic, uh, which really the onset of the pandemic was the was the onset of, of like a six fold increase in our services. So we we had done um, services for a short period of time um, once a week um, that winter, and then we increased to anywhere from five to seven times uh, shifts a week. 
Um, so we we thought a lot about how many of the syringe services across the state, within the city and nationwide, tend to serve more men than women, um, and certainly more cis people than um, trans folks. And just what are some ways to um, make sure that that women, um, regardless of cis or trans status, um, feel seen and one thing that we started, this is a really small example, but one thing we started doing was um, giving out what we called like femme kits, which just like, they just had like tiny little perfume samples and some candy and like lip gloss and, you know, just kind of things that who, who are, people who are more like femme presenting might enjoy. And it allowed us to reach through the crowd of men and be like, aha, would you like a femme kit and really engage, make eye contact with anyone who um, appeared like, you know, their their uh, dress or appearance um, seemed more feminine to us. And so that helped the women who are often literally pushed to the back um, by the men who crowd around, um, allowed us to kind of cut through that um, and and just address women first. Um, it also, also what we started doing is adding treats to our bags of pads and tampons. Um, pads and tampons are mostly taken by by women um, for themselves or uh, people in their families. A lot of people get them for grandchildren um, who are uh, teenagers or adults living with them. So we started putting candy in those. And so that's candy just for women or just for people willing to serve the menstruating folks in their families um, and something that the men are not going to get or take away. So just like little things like that, that it's like, okay, here's some chocolate. I'm going to put it in the pads and tampons bag so nobody else knows that I'm giving you specifically chocolate. Or here's something we're calling a femme pack. And anyone can have one, but, um, you know, knowing mostly the more feminine presenting people will be excited about that. Um, so these like little special nods to um, more feminine presenting people or um, people who menstruate in our outreach just kind of allows us to give a little something extra, um, knowing that it's harder to be out and about um, if you're a woman or feminine presenting. Um, and it's certainly harder to fight your way to the beginning of the line in <laughs> some of these, um, some of the like, corners where we stop and everyone kind of crowds around. Thanks, Harriet. Uh, let's go to uh, Jessica. So, when I think about this question, I think it's it's something that we in Frederick County have struggled with, and I think it's something we're kind of attempting to focus on now. So, you know, we have been doing, you know, little kind of things for women that we've been able to, you know, the hygiene products, um, those pads and tampons, pregnancy tests, um, but then, you know, also, and, you know, anybody who is homeless, you know, any people who are homeless, you know, trying to, to supply them with additional supplies that meet their needs, but more recently, We've been trying to focus on trans folks um, and just making sure that we have the actual supplies that they need. So, you know, making sure that, you know, the syringes that we are ordering are going to be what someone is actually going to need and not just what we believe they need. Um, we also are kind of in collaboration and talking with an organization to look at sites to potentially set up a site where, you know, it would kind of be like a safe haven site where we would just serve specific populations so that way they feel safer in accessing those you know sites whether it's just once a month um, but again this is something that you know has been challenging you know to really try to truly you know meet needs of marginalized populations thanks Jessica appreciate that uh, Katie I, I have to echo what Jessica said. We're in a, Cecil County is very rural. Um, the majority of our population is white. Our, our registry of participants is pretty split down the middle between male and female. Um, a lot of how we meet the needs of people is by word of mouth. So if we hear of someone that is in need of one type of supply or the other, we're able to, you know, get that for them. Um, we offer male, female deodorant. We offer um, hygiene supplies for, you know, we have tampons, we have pads, we have razors, we have uh, no water shave gel. Um, I was actually really excited um, to have 
our first uh, trans female participant register with me. And she was super, super open and was able to give me a lot of insight about how to try and engage more um, people to meet their needs. And I, you know, I follow up with her all the time. She feels really comfortable with me. Um, we also offer, uh, I talked to her about her hormones and what supplies she might need when she gets them. And I was able to get those for her. Um, and that's kind of just having an open line of communication with, with individuals about what their needs might be. But it is a struggle here and we recognize it and we, we do try to, to rectify. We have a consultant on staff that does um, biannual surveys of participants to see how better we can meet needs um, from different populations, so. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Brother Mark, you want to take us home? <laughs> yeah, I need a very big vehicle to do all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a very interesting question as well. I, I, um, we, we, we have just made a commitment to uh, be consistent and to be there and to um, take notice of what we're, what we're learning and respond to what we're learning by trying to have on board what the needs of our population are. Um, what's interesting to me about this question is, is that within these individual groups of people that use or inject drugs, you know, they're very accepting of one another. You know, if you go into a trap house, um, a person doesn't care if you're gay, straight, black, white, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, they have one agenda. And um, I, I think the marginalization a lot of times comes from the way services are provided. Um, and the stigmas that have been uh, built up over time. Um, but, but, you know, we, 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 we're out here, we are um, connecting with people and we are trying to meet the need as they're presented. And if we aren't able to do it on the spot, then we communicate that information back to our agency so that we can try to muster up the resources to be able to the next time we show up, have what people need um, and we keep the ball rolling. Uh, but it, it's very interesting to me that in, in those particular silos of people, communities of people, they, you know, they're very accepting of one another. There's no, there's no stigma amongst one another, you know, they, they, and that's probably why people are able to stay as cohesive in these, in these groups as they are. Um, uh, <laughs> anyway. No, I appreciate that. I, I, did I cut you off, Mark? Or were you? No, no, no. I was, oh. I was buttoning my lip. I was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, Mark, thank you. Um, <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, I want to just uh, do an immediate shout out to our, our panel members, um, Mark, Jessica, Harriet, and Katie. Um, First of all, just want to thank you for the work that you do and your teams, uh, especially with outreach, uh, going out into the community, which in, in my view is uh, the harder hit of service delivery, right, um, just because of COVID. So thank you so much for that. Your sharing today was generous, and the way that you and your teams care is overwhelming. So we appreciate uh, each and every one of you and, and everybody else in the room, too, for the work that they're doing. Um, before we close out, Emily um, from the Marty team is going to close us out, uh, but I want to give uh, Aaron from NDH an opportunity to share any of her final comments. And uh, um, if anybody else on the team, uh, the hosting team wants to say something, please let me know and I'll create space for that as well. So Aaron. Hi, good morning slash almost afternoon to everyone. Um, thanks for another great day of training and for participating and, and sticking with us to the end of this. And thanks to Marty for all their hard work putting this together, um, as well as um, you know my team with the Center for Harm Reduction Services. Um, this is just an incredible job. Two things I wanna say as we close. Um, I'm so excited that it's snowing out. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else is, but I know uh, Garrett County also already has four inches on the ground. 
Um, fun fact about me, I'm from Buffalo, New York, uh, so I love snow. <laughs> so I'm just super psyched at snowing before, um, you know, my holidays begin. So uh, that being said, uh, you know, we provide funding to many of our uh, syringe service programs. Um, we're very honored and excited to do that. Um, if you ever need swag to stay warm while you're doing outreach, don't hesitate to ask us about that and, and uh, include that in your budget. You know, we do believe in um, keeping you warm with your branded materials or whatever helps you be recognizable and, and safe and warm um, while you're engaging your communities. Uh, so just wanted to acknowledge that as I watch the snow come down outside. Um, Secondly, um, we are releasing some COVID related guidance. Um, so I know that that's, you know, that was a huge theme, obviously, today. Um, and what everyone's facing as you start programs or, you know, continue to support uh, the operations of your programs as the epidemic, as, as the pandemic evolves. Um, we're here to um, continue supporting you in that. Um, any adjustments to policies and procedures that need to be made or um, we're also um, very excited to uh, have supported a, a video project that actually shows how many uh, programs are um, you know actually providing these services in a safe uh, meaningful way um, so just wanted to, to highlight that work um, and, and uh, say thanks again to all of you. And I look forward to working with you all um, moving forward. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate that. Uh, quick shout out to Dana and Allison for uh, starting us off this, this morning. A quick shout out to the uh, Marty team, um, Mira for monitoring the chat today, Ray for handling the tech. And with that said, I am going to turn it over to Emily for our final comments. Thank you. Hi, thanks. This is Emily, can you hear me? Yes. I'm gonna, great, thank yes, you. I, I just wanted to repeat again, thank you so much to the panelists and I wanted to put their names up here so you could see them in case you have any follow-up questions. I hope that's okay to all the panelists. Um, uh, Mark, Key, Jessica, and Harriet. Um, and a couple final reminders. Um, um, uh, please complete all of the um, core training series for the, I'm sorry, all of the sessions for the SSP core training series by January 15th. I know lots of you participated along the way um, when we did the, um, viewed the trainings together and had breakout groups afterwards. Um, uh, but you do have some time if you weren't able to complete them all. Um, January 15th is our target date. Um, we'll be providing certificates of completion in late January. Um, and so we'll be reaching out to individual programs. We from Marty will be reaching out for, to individual programs um, for confirmation of, of who in the staff has completed all trainings. Um, and those people will be receiving certificates of completion. And then we ask as well that you complete an evaluation of, of the full training series. Um, if you've not completed all of the parts, that's okay. We'd rather have you fill it out today. Um, and um, so you can base it on whatever parts you have completed. Um, and Mira, I believe is putting that in the chat, uh, the link to that. Um, and just a reminder, you've seen this before, but this is the, the schedule of all of the, um, uh, the different sessions with the links. I have it here just as a visual cue. It's in your email. If you've not seen this, you can reach out to the Marty team um, at marty at thhsbaltimore.org. And a big thanks again to the, the Maryland Harm Reduction Training Institute team, Mira, Ray, and Saul, um, to the Center of Harm Reduction Services, and especially those who've been involved in planning this training series. Um, uh, Allison, Dana, Aaron, Leslie, and Mark, and thank you to all of you um, for all of the work that you do to support the health and well-being of people in Maryland. Um, it's, it's, it's really important work that's become more challenging, obviously, in 2020, um, and I am really grateful to live in a place that's supporting this kind of work. Um, so thank you for that, and I think we will close there.